everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Plumley. I'm the Energy Code Program Manager with SPEAR. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, shortly after today's webinar, you'll receive a course evaluation form from Kathy Lawrence. Uh, if you're wanting CEUs, ICC CEUs, please make sure you complete the evaluation and submit it. Uh, after submitting it, you'll receive your course completion certificate from Kathy that contains the course ID number that you'll be using to report your CEUs. Uh, also, the webinar is being recorded uh, and will make its way to Spears' YouTube channel. Uh, you can find the link on our resource pages at eepartnerships.org. Um, and it also has a link to our YouTube channel that has other energy and HVAC related videos, as well as videos of policy uh, and legislation as it relates to energy efficiency. So lastly, the chat option is open. Um, we'll be holding all questions to the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, and then I'll review them at the end. So in case you're not familiar with SPEAR, um, we're a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advocate the acceleration and adoption of the latest energy efficiency codes, including energy efficiency products and services that are offered throughout Texas and Oklahoma. So my job is to educate, teach, or train all things related to IECC and the IRC, including the residential and commercial, also including the ASHRAE 90.1 for commercial. Uh, we offer online and in-person training as well as on-site field trainings for inspectors, uh, contractors, and trades. Uh, we have funding that allows me to travel anywhere in Texas and Oklahoma. This funding also includes uh, our purchasing of IECC books that I can hand out at in-person and on-site field trainings. So if you or your organization, jurisdiction would like to schedule something with me or any of our team members with SPEAR, please email me and we'll get that scheduled. Uh, next, I have three quick poll questions I'd like to ask. They'll all pop up at the same time, so please take just a couple of minutes to answer that, and your feedback is greatly appreciated. So it should be launched, and we'll get just a couple of minutes to have those things answered. Thanks for your participation in this. This kind of helps me set and focus my training um, as I go forward um, with SPEAR and, and launching some of the trainings for next year. Now we have about half the, half the room has actually responded, so we'll give this another 30 more seconds. I see nobody's in the 2012 uh, edition of the IECC, or they haven't responded with that. All right, I'll leave that up for a couple more seconds, but we'll go ahead and move forward. we got a lot of information for this. Um, again, thanks again for your participation on that. Oh, okay, got it. There is one from the City of Fars 2012 as well, so thank you. So a little bit about me, uh, prior to coming to SPEAR, uh, I worked as an energy auditor, energy inspector, and manager of one of the of North Texas's largest third-party energy verifiers. I have spent over 10 years uh, in the energy-related inspections from existing and new family, uh, new single-family and multifamily construction, as well as energy audits on existing houses. So just give me a few minutes to read. I'm not going to read through all of those, but uh, that's kind of a little about where I came from. Again, thanks for the polling questions answered. I will close that now. Thank you again. Um, after 10 years, uh, I felt like I kind of know things a little bit to talk about at parties. Um, people say, what do you do? And then we kind of go into the, here's what I do, and I can talk on forever about energy efficiency. But here's a couple of things I feel like I'm good at. Uh, most of the energy inspectors, uh, if you're an energy inspector and you've been certified, once you've attained that certification that says, I know something about energy, all you really want to do is follow the book word for word and ensure that every house is 100%. Uh, reality kicks in eventually and you realize that construction is messy. It's far from perfect. Not every house will hit 100%. 
Uh, I quickly learned that the title or, or given the title Captain Red Tag from one of our builders was not a good thing. And you realize that when the client's paying for you or for your inspection services or you to inspect this, your uh, the homes, sometimes you have to make compromises. So that is understandable from that side of it. So now a little bit of info about IECC and how it's proposed and developed. Uh, we go through this for each of our presentations. It's kind of part of what we are asked to, uh, to, to show. So yes, changes are coming with the 2021. Whoops. Um, everyone remembers if you were here long enough between the 2009 and 2012, it was about a 12 to 15% increase in energy efficiency. Uh, then we have a little bit of nothing between 15 and 18. Uh, and then with the 2021 comes another 9% increase. So this chart continues to be updated for a final target of at least a net zero. So that may happen in 2030. That may be extended to 2050. But that's where a house is built to code. And then you're given a better opportunity to produce on-site power that's equal to the power used by the building. So it ends up in a net zero uh, cost or net zero energy usage from the grid. But in order for that to happen, buildings need to be very energy efficient before installing solar, wind, or geothermal, or any other power generating technology that's yet to come. So who doesn't want to be able to power your whole house just plugging it into your Ford Lightning F-150, as the commercial shows? I know I do, but most houses built today uh, would probably take two or more of those to power your house because of the inefficiency in how the house was built. Um, with the 2021 and beyond, the IECC is now being developed with an ANSI standard process, which has a smaller committee uh, and is reviewed um, by smaller committees. The public comments are reviewed by the smaller committee. Then they use that to add, remove, or adjust the sections for the next code cycle. It's still on a three-year code cycle. Right now, uh, the 2024 uh, residential is open for public comment. comment. We talked about this in the last presentation, but the climate zone has uh, largely remained unchanged for several code cycles. Uh, but then IECC decided to move to more of an accurate climate zone um, from ASHRAE. With this climate zone, parts of the country are getting hotter, drier, wetter, colder. IECC and ASHRAE will adjust each county as needed. So this might bring some confusion to some builders that build in different counties and they're now building the same house in different climate zones. Uh, high volume builders usually choose to build all their houses to meet the newest version to lessen confusion uh, for the contractors and suppliers. I know I'm in the city of Rowlett that's in Dallas County. It's split between Dallas and Rockwall County. So after calling the city and talking to their CBO, they've decided they're going to stick to just Climate Zone 2A and, and not enforce 3A on the Rockwall side. So that kind of makes things less confusing, but it also adds to a, a lesser ACH or a higher ACH target being built less tight to just be 2A, but I get their decision for that. Uh, as stated in my previous uh, presentations, I made a little boo-boo, uh, the 2021 IECC will not include a pre-insulation inspection, also known as the polyseal inspection, but this does come with the 2024 IECC, uh, again, which is currently in the public comment stage for the residential portions. The commercial is already closed. Uh, hopefully, most of your builders are getting the polyseal inspection done. This is a vital to confirming all penetrations to the unconditioned spaces are properly sealed. Uh, not only does this ensure a, blower, a lower blower door score, but more importantly, it lessens the occurrence of moisture entering to the building through these holes. Uh, lastly, it keeps air uh, from moving in and out of the wall insulation, which once air is introduced into wall insulation, it affects the overall R value of that wall. Uh, so a leaky wall that's about an R13 is probably functioning or effective R value is more like 9 or 10. Uh, sadly, a large portion of these builders, they only are concerned with just passing a blower door and don't fully understand the impact of allowing the houses to only meet the minimum. Uh, a house built to just the minimum, of course, is the worst house that can be built to code. Uh, and with so much happening in the rural areas, uh, many of these buildings or houses are being built to, in non-jurisdictional areas that are not being held to any recent updated versions of the IECC. Uh, these photos kind of speak for themselves, but all penetrations into the unconditioned space must be sealed. Uh, these are the easy ones to find, but with ceiling height changes, window bump outs, architectural design features, 
Uh, things like that get complicated really fast. Uh, the pink gasket you see on the top of these walls is the cheapest and easiest way to seal the junction between conditioned inside from the unconditioned attic. Uh, but many times builders and contractors push back on having to do this. Uh, they feel that they can build a house that's tight enough to pass the blower door. Uh, that might be true, but for a snapshot in time, it might pass the blower door at the final. Once the wood shrinks, which we know it always will because it dries out over time, the house becomes more leakier um, and is no longer energy efficient, kind of defeating the whole purpose. The gasket will fill that gap as the wood shrinks and contracts. It still takes up that gap. Uh, it's simple. It comes down to the longer you trap air that is used, it has used energy to become conditioned, the smaller amount of times that energy is having to use again to condition new air happening over and over. So the least amount of times you have to recondition, the more energy efficient the building is. This is just kind of a quick snapshot of a chart. We're looking at the second most important job after uh, verifying all holes are sealed is to verify that all insulation meet manufacturer's instruction of installation, also kind of known as grade one install. Uh, things to verify or voids, gaps, compressions, the higher the percentage, uh, the lower the effective R value. As you can see from the chart here, an R13 wall with only 4% gaps, that's insulation missing, uh, will perform at about an, an R9 level. So now punch holes in that wall, call them windows and doors, and the overall weighted average of that wall becomes more like a 5 or a 6, or less depending on the square footage of the wall compared to the square footage of the openings. So it's kind of like a domino effect. Do a, a poor job of sealing the holes in the air barrier, do a poor job of installing the insulation, that add windows and doors, you might as well not insulate. Not really. Uh, that's just kind of poking fun at it. Uh, but the more heat transfer that happens, the more likely the movement of the condensation point within the wall. This is kind of where it becomes very important. Not just air movement, but condensation points can move. If the heat from the outside is allowed to move faster through the wall, the closer it can get to the colder inside air, possibly reaching the cold surface of the sheetrock. Uh, the place where hot meets cold becomes a condensation point, and that's not a good thing. So bad things can happen inside the wall, even on the interior surfaces. Uh, once the occup occupants can see that on the interior surface, then it becomes a warranty call and possible litigation. Uh, most builders call in and say, hey, I need a blower door or a duct blaster done because they feel like it's just a hole somewhere that can be stopped. Uh, but many of the times that result comes in an inconclusive findings. So it's not due to air leakage so much, but most likely due to voids uh, like gaps, compressions in the insulation that's allowing for heat transfer to happen faster. So knee walls, I always stress this, this is not a specific inspection, but knee walls so exterior walls see a temperature difference varying from highs to lows, but no part of the country sees outside temperatures as high as 130, 140, or 160 or more, but knee walls do. So these are handled basically like just an interior wall. If the interior wall is called for, called for it to be an R13, so is the knee wall, but you have a higher difference in temperature when it comes to it being separated from an attic. Uh, these are widely overlooked and are considered only interior walls that just happen to separate condition from unconditioned within the building's thermal envelope, and but they should be specifically addressed and verified that all insulation in those knee walls are six-sided encapsulated, um, top, bottom, side, side, front, back, and then completely airtight and the correct R value has been installed and also is achieving an installation of grade one. Uh, anything less than that greatly increases the heat transfer and heat load that's allowed to enter the conditioned space. Uh, many times these are high enough on the wall above the occupant's head, so it's not really called upon as a complaint of discomfort. But the load calculations and sizing that's used for HVAC design is considering these areas to be done properly with insulation and air sealing. So not having these details done correctly will lead to the HVAC unit not being able to meet those loads and the occupants no longer will be comfortable. This in turn leads to occupant turning down the thermostat or turning up the thermostat, which increases the energy used just to maintain comfort. So these are specific areas that should be done correctly. 
So just the final inspection, several items must be verified and collected at final inspection from the blower door to light count to collecting equipment model numbers, including water heater and HVAC systems. Uh, running the blower door is kind of like grading how well the house was built. So how tight were they able to get it? Keep in mind, all inspections, again, is a snapshot in time. Anything can and does happen once the inspector walks out. Uh, every contractor, especially electricians and plumbers, always have their foot saws with them and can easily cut holes or kick holes in a wall uh, on a well-done air barrier. Uh, if this is done after the pre-drywall inspection, it may never be noticed until a blower door is ran, and then you have a higher than normal leakage. So a popular myth with blower door from builders and CMs is that it can pinpoint and find areas of leakage. So that's far from the truth. So blower doors only estimate air leakage from the entire house at a known pressure. The leakage can happen anywhere, including exterior walls, ceiling penetrations, subfloor connections, connections to porches and patios, most of which can no longer be seen or fixed at the final stage. That's why the polyseal and pre-drywall inspections are the two that you want to get done right and as close to 100% as you can. So I know builders have to keep a schedule. I get it. But if builders only call in a pre-drywall inspection and let's say the low volt contractor hasn't made it there yet to run TV drops, phone drops, internet drops, then the house basically is being set up for failing a blower door uh, at the final inspection. Then the builder, the builder basically looks at you for an explanation as to why it's failing and is unable or unwilling to go to the expense of fixing it or redoing the measures to fix it. So having attic blown insulation in a house where the, the low voltage holes in the top plates weren't sealed, it costs a lot to remove insulation and now air seal it from the top. So I've been in the middle of countless of numbers of these things over the time. So 95% of the time, this results in being left as is or nothing being done due to the additional cost. Um, they usually reach out to the CBO and then it's allowed. So I can go on and on with that, but that's not what this platform is for. Um now we've gone briefly over the inspections. I know that's kind of something I want to cover on each of these, but let's go through the meat of it. So both the 2015 and 2018 IECC have mandatory items. It said mandatory in parentheses that must be met regardless of the pathway being used. Um, but with the 2012, those titled measures were removed, but not gone. So these became a list of prescriptive requirements that are listed in a table that must be followed depending on which path is used. And so that's kind of what we're gonna go through right now. Uh, the prescriptive path, just to get this kind of out of the way, is pretty simple. It's basically word for word. Since there's nothing listed as mandatory, then all sections must be followed and met. Uh, includes R401 general requirements, R402, the building thermal envelope, R403, mechanical systems, and then 404, electrical power and lighting. Uh, easy enough, but most builders don't follow this because it's not allowing flexibility for trade-offs. Uh, and some of the items are more stringent, like a higher R value in the wall must be used as opposed to using performance. So it increases the cost of building the house. So most builders don't use prescriptive pathways. So no more mandatory items, but nothing being titled as mandatory doesn't mean that there's no longer things that are required. So since performance path is used most often, I thought it'd be easier to go through the prescriptive list of just those items that have to be used during a performance path. So um, this just kind of will spell out, I guess we could call them mandatory, still has to be followed. It's prescriptive measures that have to be followed when doing the performance path. So before we move on, I'd like to talk about what was a good idea, what is a good idea from the committee when they actually designed or, or went through the 2021. But they're being qu quickly written off uh, during a code adoption process. Your city may have done the same thing, but it's the additional energy efficiency measures. How it was supposed to work is if you did prescriptive performance or ERI, you still had to do an additional energy efficient measure. One of these five things that are listed. Um, if the prescriptive is used, then you could do any of these. If perform is, performance is used, it kind of changes the way the modeling is done. So it kind of lowers the energy by 5% on the referenced home, which means you have to be even less efficient. I mean, you have to be even more efficient than the referenced home that you're modeling against. So you can't just build a crappy house and then do one of these measures to make it pass. It kind of says you have to be 95% or better 
and then you still have to do one of these measures. And then when you do ERI, it takes the ERI two-digit number and says you have to be five points less than the target for your climate zone and then still have to do one of these additional energy efficiency measures. All cities that I've seen adopt the 2021 is currently dis or that is currently discussing 2021 are amending these out entirely for the whole section or just making them an option, not leaving them in as a requirement. I'd like to at least see the last, the later part of that being done. So it's just left as an option for builders that do like to build more energy efficient and can use that as a marketing tool towards uh, comparing themselves to other builders. But removing that entirely, I know they still can do it, um, but it's easier to say that we have followed addition, additional measures to be even more energy efficient. So the title of the uh, simulated performance alternative, what it was called in 2012, 2015, has been changed to 20 to just basically saying total building performance. Uh, this brings in line more all of the components, not just the components used in the energy model. So not much has changed, but instead of pointing to the mandatory item, it now references table R405.2, which is a list of the prescriptive sections that are used, which is what we're going to go through next. Uh, one of the changes was the reduction of the um, duct R value. So with the 2015 and 2018 duct insulation per prescriptive path was used based on size and location. For example, if you have it in the attic or in a crawl space, then you have to use one R value or another. You have to either use eight or six, depending on whether it was greater than or equal to three inches or less than or equal to three inches. Um, but if size stated that it was an R8, um, then our performance path with 2015 and 2018 said all ducts, depending not dependent on size or location, can be an R6. Now they've removed that. I know that sounds easier, but now they've removed the, the reduction to R6, and it now says you have to follow prescriptive requirements that now designates location and size to show R value compliance. Uh, most builders and contractors will stick to using one R value for all duct work, like using R8 for everything. It's rare, I think, to ever see a duct less than three. Um, it, I'm sure it can happen out there, but that's not normally used in HVAC um, of a single family home. So everything's basically R8 going forward for 2021. So the first one off the gate, of course, is the certificate. This is easy. These are most of the times found on the electrical panel. Uh, or a water shutoff valve box cover and located in the garage. All the items listed must be filled out by the energy inspector or third-party verifier, uh, and then either left on site or stuck to one of these panels, meaning an inspector should not take the builder's word for what they're going to do. They have to put eyes on it and use what was actually installed on the house as they went through the inspection process. Added to the requirement of the 2021, they only added the Energy compliance path now must be on the certificate. So prescriptive total building performance or ERI uh, must appear on the certificate. This is going to reflect how it was done through permitting with the city, and it should match that same thing. It shouldn't be different. They can't go total performance and then put ERI on the path. That's two different pathways, meaning two different things happen, and it can't be different. It must be the same. Uh, we don't really see these in our climate zones, vapor recharters. Um, but basically, it's just saying any northern climates that are required to do a vapor retarder is basically based on the sections from the IRC um, in 1101.7 of the IRC and does not include climate zones one, two, or three. So Eve baffles. So this has always been part of the code, and the requirements kind of lean back on manufacturer's instructions. But as that happens a lot with other things, the intent of the requirement was not fully being met. So the 2021 IEC further defined the requirement to meet the intent of the manufacturer's instructions. So as we can see here, it says air permeable insulation in vented attics, a baffle shall be installed adjacent to soffit vents or eave vents. Baffles shall maintain a net free area opening equal to or greater than the size of the vent. A baffle shall extend over the top of the attic insulation. And then attic should be of any solid material. So calculating the net free air isn't an easy thing to do during inspection. Uh, but as long as it's not crushed, uh, then normally it meets that requirement. Rule of thumb, 
basically is when it's used for the baffle should be the width of the cavity. So the top left picture you see, it's the width of the cavity. The top right photo is showing that one's been split in half and they're only using half of it in a larger cavity. That's not enough net free air and also allows for wind washing on both sides to happen to the insulation. So it should not be allowed. The last two additions, so baffle shell and be installed on the outer edge of the exterior wall top plate to provide attic insulation coverage over the top plate. And then the soffit, we're not continuous, so they're using vents, um, not a continuous soffit. Um, those baffles should be installed continuously as well. So if, the, if they're using vents and not a continuous soffit, they still need to do continuous baffles throughout all cavities. This prevents any ventilation air to actually bypass one of these baffles and, and have wind washing in the attic on that insulation. So that last one's a great addition. I think installing continuous baffles, even on non-conditioned continuous soffits, um, prevents a lot of wind washing from happening. But that lower right-hand picture, uh, seeing that it's been, it's been stapled to the very back, allowing for the insulation to fully cover the top plate, is not normally what I was seeing in the world of inspections when I was doing inspections in the field. They were normally stapling it to the top plate on the front. They feel like that's enough to cover it, but the top plates are left exposed to the attic air, and that's not a good thing. So attic access hatches and doors, uh, these must be weather stripped and access that prevents damaging or compressing the surrounding insulation. So as you see in these photos, the top left, basically the vertical door appears to be weather stripped on all three sides and a threshold on the bottom. So on the right, picture at the bottom, you see the horizontal hatch, also known as a scuttle hole. It has damming on all four, four sides to prevent loose fill insulation from falling into the conditioned space. It has a bat that's affixed to the top of the cover. Um, it also appears to have decking to the right so that when the cover is opened, it has a place to sit without damaging or compressing the loose fill insulation. This hits all the marks to show a correct installation. That's kind of what that thumbs up is and happy face that's from the Department of Energy. But how many of us sees this, see this being done like this on a regular basis? So most of the time the builders would tell the energy rater that scuttle hole is only for inspection purposes only and will be caulked shut after CO inspection was done. With that statement, I, I feel that most of that's not being weather stripped and rarely have insulation on top of the covers. So if you're lucky, the insulation contractors will pre-bat around these holes before sheetrock and not just use loose fill so that insulation doesn't fall into the conditioned space when opened. Sometimes you get things like this, um, if you can see that pretty well. So does this meet the intent? Kind of. Is it permanent? Probably not. So this is a lattice work that's made out of poly seal. It's holding back the loose fill insulation. This might hold that insulation from falling in during the inspection, but it does not meet the intent of maintaining R value of the loose fill insulation on all three sides. So having damming would allow for the full depth of insulation, say it's R49, R60, R38, to be permanently install installed all the way up to the edge of the opening. Doing it this way, the insulation still tapers down to the opening, allowing for less R value as it reaches the opening. So as this as it states in code, this is not compliant with the 2021 IECC requirements. So what they're trying to get away from is the tapering of insulation when it meets the top plate of a, a wall separating condition from unconditioned. They really would like to see uh, that R value being maintained all the way up to the edge. Uh, these are really no longer common in our climate zone unless you have a big custom house, uh, but it's crawl spaces. So New homes being constructed, crawl space, specific requirements have to be met. Uh, both of these are unvented crawl spaces, so it's allowed to do foam or continuous insulation against the wall. Uh, but now it brings in the requirement also that you have to now have the dirt or exposed earth on the bottom covered with a vapor barrier. If these were vented, then the floor above the crawl space is now considered the boundary of the thermal envelope, and that's where it starts and stops. Uh, where it's conditioned from unconditioned and has to be insulated properly, and the insulation needs to be pushed up to actually be in contact with the floor above. 
So installation. So this is kind of the, the big checklist that's in the code. It specifically deals with table R402.1 point or 0.4.1.1. It's called out by component and states the criteria of each air barrier and insulation. I know this is kind of hard to read. Um, so I tried to fit the whole checklist on this on the slide. Uh, but this is kind of a list that third party verifiers use when doing their checklist during the inspection. So it helps identify and specifically describe how each component is to be air sealed and insulated. When I was doing inspections, this was part of a digital inspection on an iPad. These things were called out and then we had to verify was it done per this chart. Uh, some additions that were made, if you can see in blue, that means it's an addition to the 2021 rim joists. So the junction of the rim board and the seal plate and the rim board to the subfloor must be sealed. So that kind of always was a, is it sealed? Is it not sealed? Does it have to be? Does it not have to be? Now the code says it has to be. And then also the rim joist insulation must now be supported to maintain permanent contact with the exterior rim board insulation or the rim board. So in other words, the insulation now has to be permanently affixed. So that was never the case previously. It didn't really specify. So just friction fitting those and standing them up was done on 99% of the houses. Knowing that that may fall out in the future, now the code says it must be, uh, it must maintain permanent contact. Narrow cavities have now been better identified or defined as one inch or less. And it says that you're allowed to use poly seal as opposed to insulation. Why this is important is it identifies the size so that anything over one inch must be insulated. So there was many times I saw cavities as big as three inches just being filled with poly seal instead of insulation. And I don't fully know the R value per inch of poly, but I seriously doubt it's the same as a fiberglass bat. So now that gives that definition, it gives leverage to the inspector to no longer allow it. Uh, no change to sprinklers at the bottom, but this was kind of a pet peeve of mine when I was doing the inspections. It basically says that they must be, or if they're required to be sealed to the sheetrock, uh, they need to be done for a manner that's recommended by the manufacturer. I understand that the caps can't be sealed to the sheetrock, but the sprinkler can, just like a can light, should always be sealed where it penetrates the ceiling or wall sheetrock. So too many times I had to go back and forth with CMs, CBOs, to try to get these things sealed. So even the manufacturer states that it's okay to do this, but most installers would say no. And so with a two-story or a three-story townhome with over 30 to 50 sprinkler cans, it made it very difficult to hit the required ACH without asking them to be sealed. So it can be done. It's just a lot of pushback a lot of times to not do it. If it's done right, it doesn't affect how they're going to uh, function in case of a fire. Testing with the blower door. This kind of got a little confusing from the 2012-2015. So confusing meaning prescriptive path states that any building or dwelling uh, following any compliance path has a limit of 5 ACH, which kind of tells me, okay, then that's giving me the chance of, I, even if I follow performance, I go 5 ACH. But then the very next section has a leakage rate and it breaks it up by climate zones. It said climate zone three, one, I mean, zero, one and two are at five and then three ACH for three through eight. So that kind of brings part of Texas at five, part of Texas at three. Um, but with performance path it is required to use only section R402.4.1.2 uh, uh, to be followed, allowing the higher five ACH for all buildings and all climate zones. So it kind of gets confusing. I reached out to a few energy modelers and, and third-party verifiers to see how they're reading this and how they're interpreting it. And what I'm being told is they're interpreting it by if you use the performance path or the ERI, their allowance is up to five ACH is acceptable through all climate zones. But when using prescriptive, it's broken up by specific climate zone requirements. So not sure if your jurisdiction is going to follow the same thing. I think a lot of you are more like in the South, just using climate zone three. So it's already five, uh, I'm sorry, climate zone two. So it's already climate or a five ACH. But in Dallas and further up where it goes into three, it kind of gets confusing. So hopefully that gets reworded uh, on some renditions or versions or in the next code cycle. So not much has changed for 2021 on this, but the ACH 
uh, area weighted average dropped from a 0.40 to uh, from a from a 0 0.50. So it kind of dropped the ACH uh, trade off allowance for that. Same as with 2015, 2018, HVAC systems must have their own thermostat. You can't just use one thermostat for two systems. It must be uh, each thermostat needs to run its own system. You can have two thermostats for one system, such as a zone system, but it can't be the other way around. Programmable thermostat, not much changed here. Uh, what they did was they added uh, the term and different days of the week. So that kind of better spelled out that these must be programmed. I think I'd, going through this last time, it should be set up and programmed before the homeowner actually takes occupants of occupation of the home. Uh, but a lot of times they're not. And during the construction time, a lot of times we see uh, contractors dropping that down into the 50s, um, leaving it that way. I know when flooring is installed, it has to be acclimated to the temperature before installing carpet. It needs to be warm. And same with flooring, uh, but it should be set back at night to where it doesn't happen. That's a little bit of a waste of energy as it's being constructed. Uh, no change here. Heat pumps are still great pieces of machinery because they move heat instead of creating heat. There's no byproduct losses like there is with gas furnaces. Uh, their only downfall is during the defrost cycle, or if it's too cold outside, they have to use electric resistance heater, which is kind of what's being shown on the slide. Uh, during that storm with Texas, that storm Uri, a lot of heat pumps had to resort to getting these electric um, resistance heat to, to run to actually keep the house going. That was a big struggle and grind on the grid. Uh, but the big thing here is it can't be used if the compressor can meet the load. It, it, shouldn't, it should have a lockout and it should not be able to be used by the homeowner, meaning they can't use electric resistant because they felt like it's warmer heat, they have to use the heat pump. Ducts um, with the performance path, R403.3 um, and then 403.3.1 are required. So basically uh, 303 uh, ducts and air handlers should be installed in accordance to uh, the sections listed here. And then with the performance path, you have to use uh, no, I'm sorry, they they exclude 403.3.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6, which 0.2 is ducts are located in conditioned space. This actually gives the fact that you have to do duct testing regardless of its location. 0.3, ducts are buried within the ceiling insulation. It takes that out. And then also the leakage rate limit um, is not um, being used. That's in the prescriptive path only. So that kind of takes those three out when it's done with the performance path. Kind of makes it a little bit confusing, but that's why we rely on the energy models modelers to do it. So continue on with duct testing. So you can still do a rough in or a post-construction test. Both tests must be performed at 20 pa 25 pascals. During the test, all supply and return boots must be covered or taped. Uh, and if mechanical ventilation, aka fresh air, is tied into the ducts or plenum, the inlet or outlet. Uh, can't be taped, but there must be a damper that is closed since it's not being used. Um, with that, again, I just spoke about this a minute ago, but just to reiter reiterate this again, if you have a fully encapsulated house and you're doing performance, um, there's no more, even if you're doing any pathway, there's no more exception or exemption for testing if they're all in condition space. So everything has to be now tested. It can't just say, well, it's a fully encapsulated. You don't have to test it anymore. You still have to test the system. So new change here, uh, mechanical system piping insulation. These include, but not limited to, hot water piping, the large refrigerant, refrigerant line for HVAC units, the condensate piping for HVAC unit. Lots of times that condensate pipe is overlooked. And then end joints and connections must be taped to avoid future separation. Protection of pipe insulation. Uh, this has kind of gone to an extreme here. It's a plastic pipe that's coming from the wall to the unit itself. Uh, no real change here, but that it, whatever piping insulation is exposed to the weather, it must be protected from damage, including that caused by sunlight, moisture, uh, equipment maintenance, and wind. Protection shall be shield shielding from solar radiation that causes degradation to that material. It must be UVA per, or U UV protected. And that adhesive tape, just using tape, should be prohibited.
So it's got to have what they call Armaflex, which has that kind of protection or something like this that's PVC. It can't just be a standard foam wrap pipe because it will fall apart over time. So heated water circulation and temperature maintenance systems, no real change here. This last sentence was added uh, to limit extremely hot water from entering cold water piping. Basically, it limits it from not greater than 104 being entered into cold water pipes. So that actually has been added for the 2021 code cycle. Here, no big change here on heat trace systems. So again, we don't normally see these in uh, new construction for single family, but larger custom home buildings may or multifamily single uh, less than three stories may also have this being brought in. Uh, not new for 2021, but but is required when following the performance path. Uh, there is something, not some, again, not normally what we see in single family, but it deals with the drain water heat recovery. So if you have a bathtub with hot water, a shower that has hot water, and as that is draining, there's a, um, a copper fixture that's on the pipe that recovers the heat from that and puts it either back into the water tank or it puts it back into the faucet itself to recover the heat that's usually lost. So that kind of spells that. That may be something that you see more in the future with higher end custom homes but not something we see currently now. Uh, 403.6 mechanical ventilation system. So not a lot changed with this, except they've added the word mechanical because a lot of the builders were saying, I have ventilation. It's a just a hole in the wall or it's a hole from the outside to the inside. So they put mechanical in there saying that you have to use a system and it clarifies that system needs to be used for mechanical ventilation. So do a houses need to breathe? Yes. Um, where we're controlling how much and when. So the tighter houses get, the more chances the indoor air quality starts to diminish. Uh, in order to keep the bad levels acceptable, the indoor air must be exhausted or diluted from incoming air. So it's either exhausted outside or it's diluted with air coming in. In Texas, it's predominantly air coming in because you don't want to exhaust conditioned cold air so they're basically bringing in outside air, um, and most of those systems that you see in this photo here, the bottom left, the two bottom pictures is an old style damper open close. The two top pictures are the Brone box and the QFresh box. They both have thermostats in them and humidistats that actually can be set to not bring in too high or too cold of air temperatures and also reduces how much humidity can be brought into the home when they're running. So with 2021, IECC testing will now be required, uh, and the ventilation rate is based off ASHRAE calculations. So here's kind of a picture of uh, an HRV or an ERV. So it doesn't really pertain to us, but this is now brought into performance and to the code. So zone seven, eight must have, have a what's called a balanced mechanical ventilation. So it takes indoor air outside as it brings outside air in. Um, if you're unfamiliar with these, what it's doing is it's tempering the air. It's not allowing very cold air to come through without warming some of it up or vice versa in the south. It will actually cool the air down, lose some of its humidity before it goes into the home. It doesn't mix the air, so you're not crossing those streams, but it goes into a heat exchanger that allows it to cross pathways with just heat itself and humidity. So the system shall be balanced to a minimum sensible heat recovery efficiency at 65% at 32 degrees at a flow greater than or equal to air design. So more chances than not now, we're looking at how is it being designed for that. Yeah, I see the thumbs up there. I'm liking this as well to have to now be tested. So it used to only be above code programs and then code was not tested. We don't know if it actually did anything. Now it has to be proven that it is. So introduced in the 2018, though, before I get to the testing part of it, the fan efficacy table um, must still be used. This ensures that the fan being used is not consuming a high amount of energy to bring in a small amount or exhaust a small amount of air. This kind of excludes the use of an air handler as it being its source of a fan unit. So 2018, it kind of said if you had an ECM motor, uh, you, you could still get away with it because that's an exemption. But now when you're doing performance and you're trying to calculate that, it's very hard to get an air handler's high energy watt and energy use to actually pass an energy model. 
uh, if used to do the, the, the fresh air itself. So to the testing side of it, so mechanical ventilation shall be tested and verified to provide minimum ventilation rates required in section 403.6. Testing shall be performed to the ventilation's requirement manufacturer's instructions or by using a flow hood, a, a box, a flow grid, or other airflow measuring devices at the fan's inlet or at the grills or at the outlet or the grills and or in the connected duct to that system. So exemption here is kitchen range hoods, range hood that's saying if they're ducted with a six inch duct or larger and has no more than one 90 degree elbow and also probably equivalent to two 45 degree elbows uh, or equivalent in the duct run, it doesn't have to be tested. So that's usually hard to see and usually hard to find. So we always have to test that. When testing the fresh air, it's based off the square footage of the house with the number of bedrooms given. Um, and it gives you the CFM required, or it uses an ASHRAE equation of CFM equals 0 0.01 times square footage of the house plus 7.5 times number of bedrooms plus one. The 0 0.01 per square foot is giving a 0 0.01 CFM per every square foot. And then 7.5 is given to every occupant of the home. And why it says number of bedrooms plus one is that they're assuming that the master has two. So that's the uh, ASHRAE equation that can be used. But using either table or equation and measuring the airflow, it must not be less than the calculated target. So unfortunately, this is contradicted by the Energy Star program that's becoming more popular to get through code because it states that it must be plus or minus 15% or 15 CFM of the target, that's a big range. Uh, that's a swing of 30 CFM or 30%. So whether code is being used or Energy Star is being used to gain permitting, uh, the target will be the same, but the acceptable tested CFM could vary greatly. So back to testing bath fans. Um, those must also be tested and show to exceed 50 CFM, meet or exceed 50 CFM. And kitchen exhaust, if tested, must also meet or exceed 100 CFM. And then all must be exhausted to the outside, not to an attic or a crawl space. So no change here. Uh, again, this has been part of the code, but it's never really been enforced, is equipment sizing and efficiency rating. So same with 2015, probably 2012, 2018, using manual J and S for mandatory. They're mandatory to use, not mandatory to turn in. However, third-party verifiers or a city official or code official asks to see it, they should be able to present that and show that it was calculated using those two manuals. So um, manual J is used to calculate heating loads for the house, meaning that software uses all available details. Uh, to come up with the load calculations. And then the S for sizing is actually used to verify, does that equipment meet or exceed the load calculations that were done by manual J? A lot of times, um, AHRI certificates are only turned in with permitting. That does not prove correct sizing and should not be allowed just to be only verified by that means, it, they must be able to see that. So if your city is adopted or is going to adopt 2021, I highly encourage that the collection of these documents be added to the request for permit documents and then fully reviewed uh, before allowing permitting to be done. So no change here with the uh, this systems here. So serving multiple dwelling units, basically it's just saying in case there are multiple dwelling units being served by one system, then you must follow the commercial section. Even if it's less than three stories, let's say it's a duplex and you've only got one system, you must still follow the commercial provisions of C403 and C404 instead of R403 of the code book. So no change here for snow, melt, and ice systems. Uh, we don't normally see these being used in, in Texas, but in Oklahoma and the hill countries around Austin, maybe. Uh, not only are they flat work, um, but they can also be for uh, ice damming on roofs. If that's a problem in those areas, they can put that up as well. But those must have automatic or manual controls that shut off when the outdoor temperature is greater than 40 degrees and then the pavement temperature is greater than 50 if it's on flat surfaces. Uh, no change here for energy for consumption of pools and spas. Uh, the energy consumption of pools and spas shall be in accordance to sections R403.10.1. 
through point three, and that must be followed with that. There are some changes to those. So for the heater section of that, they had added the heater in location with readily already already accessed. So before it just read um, that the uh, switch must be an integral part of the heater and then mounted externally or external within three feet. Now they just say ready, ready access, which basically means the control can be reached without special tools and with within range of the heater. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it can't be in the garage. You can have to go there. It has to be somewhere near the heater itself. Uh, no significant change here on time switches, uh, but there is some additional wording or rewording of the requirement. They now put uh, heaters and pump motors to be more specific to what is needing timers to be installed. Uh, covers, not a lot changed here as well, but now it has to specify um, how you got that exemption. So if someone says, hey, we have solar uh, and we're producing 75% uh, or more energy for heating, well, you have to now ask, it has to be uh, calculated by using the operational seasons, not fewer than three calendar months. So they can't say during the winter months when it's not really used, the solar is meeting that requirement of 75% or more. Again, if there's a loophole, someone will find it. And this was a loophole that someone found that said, I met that requirement. I don't need a cover. Now they say, no, nope, you have to use three months to calculate it. You can't just use the off-peak seasons to calculate it. Uh, no change here for portable spas. Portable spas, uh, like you see here, must be controlled by the requirements of APSP14, uh, which is called the Swim, Spa, and Hot Tub Industries Energy Efficiency Standards. Uh, not new to the code here, but was reworded and shortened to only state that, that residential pools and permanent residential spas uh, must now meet ASPF 15. It was a lot more wordy and a lot more lengthy with uh, how it was done in 2015 and 2018. They shortened it to just say, follow the requirements of ASPS 15. So lighting always is going to be changing from probably here on out, but as we probably all know now, 2021 has gone to 100% high efficacy lighting. No more, uh, I believe it was 75% for 12 and 90% for, uh, or 12, it was 15 was 75% and then 18 was 90% and now 2021 is 100%. Um, that excludes though the factory installed lighting for stoves, ovens, refrigerators, wine coolers. If it's part of an appliance, uh, it doesn't have to meet that requirement. So high efficacy is basically calculated by dividing the looms, which is the amount of watts, amount of light being generated by the number of watts of energy used to generate that light. Uh, for example, a 60 watt incandescent bulb that gives off 2,500 lumens uh, produces basically 42 lumens per watt. And an LED of 14 watts given off the same amount of looms produces well over 178 looms per watt of power used by that. So basically it's giving off the same amount of light, may not be the same as they say warmth of light, but it's the same amount of light, but using far less energy. So high efficacy bulbs include most CFLs and just about all LEDs is part of high efficacy. But what's now changing is um, exterior lighting is being more focused on part of this. So connecting exterior lighting for residentials Buildings shall comply with the commercial section, but there are exemptions for detached one and two family dwellings, townhomes, uh, solar powered lamps not being connected to any electrical service, uh, luminaries controlled by a motion sensor or lamps and luminaries that comply with section R404.1. So they're starting to incorporate all lighting in the house, not just what's used for the interior. And then lighting controls is something that's becoming very uh, important on how to reduce energy consumption. So controls are the new buzzword. It's a lot of it's in commercial. Uh, residential is using a little bit of it. Previous code cycles reduced the usage of energy by limiting the amount of energy it takes to produce light. But if that light was still left on for 24 hours uh, for no reason and no one was there, it still uses a lot of energy. So the code now has moved to automate or time those controls or have timed controls that limit the amount of time a fixture will be on during a day. So, however, we've seen a lot of municipalities amending this requirement out. I'm not sure why, other than the additional cost of the controls to the builder. 
Um, there are exceptions, which are bathrooms, hallways, exterior lighting fixtures, and any lighting design for safety or security. But having an occupant sensor, uh, let's say in a garage or having a, an occupant sensor in a utility room, um, it just makes sense. That way those lights aren't left on uh, forever and ever uncontrollably and using and wasting electricity. And then having dimmers as well that are installed cannot use as much lighting power because not that much light is having to be used for those specific areas in the home. So differences when using the ERI pathway. We went through the performance side of it because it's the bulk of all the prescriptive measures that are used. But when the ERI pathway is used, basically it removes R402.5, which is the maximum fenestration U factor in SHGC, which basically removes the allowable trade-offs. So that kind of hinders a few builders. But sometimes if you have to do uh, ERI, then you don't have much of a way to get around it. And where I was at, the ERI was only used in foam encapsulated houses because most of the softwares out there have not caught up or developed the calculations to properly calculate the use of foam, whereas uh, a roof deck doesn't have to be R38 foam. It can be R21 and still comply, but performance doesn't understand that in the model, so you had to use ERI to get there. So if you have a foam encapsulated house, they're probably using the ERI calculations. So this removes the trade-offs when it comes to fenestrations, but it adds the building thermal envelope. So this brings on-site renewable sections into this. In other words, it's trying to define if you use renewable, on-site renewable in the calculations, you have to do one thing. And if you're not using it in there, you have to do something else. So if it's not included, then the total building thermal envelope UA shall be less than or equal to the building thermal envelope UA using uh, using the prescriptive U factors and multiplying by 1.5, 1.15. Uh, That's too complicated to try to figure out in the field. Uh, if it is included, then the building thermal envelope shall be greater than or equal to the levels of efficiency and SHGC tables uh, from the 2015 IECC. So that kind of falls back to a previous code cycle to use for efficiency levels on uh, insulation and SHGC referring to a 2015 table to use in the ERI pathway, which sometimes gets confusing with trying to look at the energy model and seeing it referencing older code. It's, it's hard to say, then is it still acceptable? Well, according to the code, it is uh, because the ERI pathway allows that. Uh, but this brings into on-site renewable generation. So uh, jokingly, I say pretty simple, huh? It, it's really not. It gets complicated, and that's why we leave it up to the energy model orders to fix that. But we have to learn how to read those reports to make sure that it's done correctly. So that's it for today's webinar. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat. I'll check to see if there's anything in the chat there is not at the moment. Uh, the next webinars have not been titled and or prepared yet, but they'll be this around the 16th or the 30th due to holiday scheduling. The titles and dates of the next webinars are subject to change. Uh, also, the energy newsletter, which comes out the third week of every month, will also change. It more likely will come out the second week uh, due to the holiday week of the third week of December. So watch for your emails to come through for the energy newsletter during the second week of December instead of the third. And then that will also bring in the titles for the new webinars and the links to register for them. So, all right, no real questions, but thank you for that. Uh, great presentation and good job. I appreciate that. Um, this is where I'm more passionate in, in doing these webinars um, and being part of the world that you live in, which is inspection and energy modeling review. So to me, this is where my um, as I say, my party talk goes into and I start asking and talking about it until I can't talk anymore. But I appreciate you guys giving me the thumbs up for that. Um, this is always fun to do. I wish we had more time and be able to have an open discussion and keep going. But maybe that will be in the future. Again, when you get the evaluation form, please fill that out. Don't hesitate to put in there what you think you'd want to see in the coming webinars. Uh, someone last time actually put on there that they would like to see um, the different reports and how to read the different energy energy modeling reports. Uh, we're actually going to be able to do that in the coming months of next year. 
Can I rewatch this on YouTube? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. This will make its way to YouTube uh, shortly after this is done. You guys will get your evaluation form from Kathy Lawrence. You can fill that out, return that, and then um, one of our staff members will actually upload this on the YouTube channel uh, within a few days afterwards, and you can rewatch this. So again, thanks for everybody for your time. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys learned a little something there. Um, maybe now that we've covered it as a general of just going through, we'll break it into even tighter uh, measures and start breaking more into that and having pictures of field inspections and how to verify that in the field. So I appreciate your time, guys. Thank you very much.